Garage Show. Good morning, everybody. Well, a big turnout in London yesterday for the self-styled People's Vote marching because they want a second referendum. And the question I want to debate this morning is, I want to know, has yesterday's march strengthened the case for a second referendum or not? And if you think, yep, it sure has, call me on 03456060973. If you think, look, look at the Iraq protest, that made no difference and this won't make a blind bit of difference either. Text to 84850. And if you are for the people's vote, tell me, at what point do you recognise with only five and a half months to go? At what point do you give up on this campaign? Let me know your views on that by tweeting, using the hashtag Farage and LBC at LBC, and of course, Facebookers, you can watch us live and you can comment there too. Now, I am joined this morning by Lord Andrew Adonis, Labour peer and prominent leading supporter of a people's vote. The one thing that fascinates me, Andrew, is I've got people like you, um, Alistair Campbell, Sadiq Khan, very prominent figures in, in, in yesterday's march. Yet, when you were in government, you were consistently opposed to having a referendum. Because if you remember, during that period, the French had a referendum, the Dutch had a referendum, the Irish had a referendum, and we were all pushing <coughs> guys like you and saying, can we please have a vote on our... Why were you so opposed to a referendum? C- c- can I be absolutely clear, Nigel? I do not approve of referendums. At all? Uh, Except in the circumstance we're in now, where there was one two years ago. The reason why we're in this crisis now... So you disapproved of the one two years ago? uh, Yeah, I didn't support the one two years ago. And indeed, Labour, you'll remember, in the 2015 election, when this was a big election issue, Mm Labour opposed the referendum. Our view was that if there were big treaty changes and more powers were being given to the EU, then there should be some process on that. As it happens, my view is that that should have been done by Parliament, but uh, some in my party were prepared to go along with a referendum. But my view is that uh, with, with big constitutional issues of this kind the reason we have parliament is that we rely on its wisdom to get these things right but the problem we have now is because we had the referendum two years ago but we've got no way out of the brexit impasse that we're now in with a prime minister who is incapable of negotiating a well, brexit on that treaty point, on that point and so we're in a complete let's, mess let's begin with a, let's begin with a point of agreement we? andrew shuey we'll begin with a strong mm. point of agreement it may be the only one we have in the next half an hour but i would agree with you that the prime minister is taking us to the strangest of all places because whilst she wants us to leave the treaty on March the 29th, she wants to leave us so wrapped in that effectively it's a half in, half out. Well, we don't. Have the, f- the truth is, uh, we don't have the faintest idea where we're going to be by the end of next March. She's had two and a half years so far, and we've got nothing to show for it. We don't have a treaty. We don't have a political declaration. We don't have even a clear sense of what the options are. Do you know anybody, Nigel, who can explain Canada plus plus plus? Oh, I mean, it's. A, I, I don't think. I, I don't think she's a sing- not getting anywhere. At I don't all think at the a moment, single voter she? in the country would understand how the budget works. Or, I mean, you could, you know, you could argue is, this for many things. What What is clear is the Prime Minister's absolute determination is to keep us very closely wrapped into European Union rules, despite having formally left. But I'm interested in this point about democracy because let's listen to what Sadiq Khan said yesterday. Well, I can't think of anything more democratic, anything more British than trusting the judgment of the British people. I agree with Sadiq Khan totally. So the British people had this vote and you lot told us we'd lose half a million jobs. It would all be a catastrophe. So why can't you just trust the vote of the British people in 2016? Why don't we implement that? And then if you do think we need to rethink in a few years' time, that might be perfectly yeah, but, fair. But, but, Nigel, the whole point is we don't know what we're implementing because the point about the vote two years ago is there is no one single leave proposition. Indeed, well, you, there Nigel... Is actually, no, there is actually. There were two different leave campaigns Andrew, last time. Andrew, Nigel, you headed one and Boris leave. Johnson headed another. But we want to leave. No, but what do we do? Are we staying in the customs union and the single market? No. But, are we not? I, I, well, l- l- Boris Johnson let, let said we were staying we in the be. single market. Let me, let, so, so no, until he did not. So until we know, Nigel... Until we know, Nigel... It, that we cannot know what terms we're leaving on Can we just because we didn't clear, know that Andrew? two years ago and therefore we should have a referendum on the terms. Let's be clear. Every single leading player on both the Remain side and the Leave side explicitly in the months of that referendum campaign said 
that we were leaving the no, single that's, market. No, that's not correct. I'm afraid, Nigel, that's simply not correct. Daniel Hannan, one of your lieutenants I, I in the Leave ma- campaign, I said major. he said, well, actually, Boris Johnson's pretty major, isn't he? He was, Boris? Mayor, of, he was mayor of London, and while he was mayor of London, he said we would not be leaving the single market or the well, customs union. Boris Johnson, so hang on Nigel, a second, Boris know, Johnson, we didn't know what Boris we were, Johnson what we were, supported what membership. Was ago. Boris Johnson supported membership of the European Union. Boris Johnson supported membership of the single market all through his elected career as an MP, as Mayor of London, until the referendum. And once he decided he was going to back the Leave campaign, he couldn't have been clearer. Anyway, I... I, I, I that's, not, that's not the case, Nigel. He was very clear during the campaign, and indeed afterwards, in the article he wrote the week after the referendum, he, he said that options should all be on the table, yeah. including the single market. Well, he didn't write so, that. He didn't so, write that. Let's so, not um, about Boris, but, 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 but that's but the reason why, Andrew, that's the reason why we need a referendum, is because we I, weren't clear two years ago. We were when, we, when, clear. when we are clear, then people should be able to reach a judgment on that. And why should we have a referendum? I'm afraid because we had one two years ago. And therefore, in my view, which is where I agree with Sadiq, when you come to this point of crisis where you've had one referendum and we're seeking to res- resolve what it means and then give the British people a meaningful choice, I can't see any other way well, through I this but say, another referendum. You, to me, you all look very hypocritical because you oppose a referendum when you're in government. Uh, you don't want the 2016 referendum to happen and now before it's implemented, you want us to do it all yeah, again. But, but, but what, what would the question be? What, what would the question be? Well, the question would be whatever Theresa May negotiates, yes. whatever that is, and we're still waiting to see because it's two and a half years and she hasn't been able to produce anything, as against the only other viable proposition, which is staying in the European Union. Because the proposition which you've been out with a lot, Nigel, called No Deal, doesn't actually exist. Well, because there, we, we can't have no deal, because if we have no deal, planes don't fly, the ports don't operate, we have six weeks worth of medical there's supplies. There's one major problem here. So you need to tell us what it is that you think should go on the ballot paper yourself, Nigel. If you, here's su- your, here's if your you opportunity. Succeeded, if you succeeded in getting a referendum on Mrs May's deal or remaining, I couldn't vote. 17.4 million of us couldn't vote. We'd, we'd what, be what, utterly disenfranchised. What, what would you want to vote on, Nigel? Can I ask you the question? I what, what, I, is I the proposition, I, what is the proposition you I would have, want to I, be I on the ballot? Voted. Well, have, you said you couldn't vote in that scenario. I, so what's well, of course the propos- not, because so you wouldn't be giving me the option of leaving the European uh, but Union. But what is the proposition you want on the ballot paper? I don't want another ballot paper. No, I've had, I, well, I'm asking you, Andrew, Nigel. You said that you couldn't the, vote. We've Nigel, had the people's vote. Nigel, you've got all your listeners turning on your every word at the moment. What is the proposition that you want? If you want a second referendum, why would you not give me the option of leaving? Because because Mrs May's Mrs. Checkers May's, plan, Mrs May's checkers plan does involve leaving. We would it, leave the European Union. We'd still, at the be, end. We we'd would still leave, be in the single market, we'd li- would, which which is perfectly compatible with leaving the European Union. Not to me, it's Nor- not. Norway is in the single market, not in the European Union. I'm afraid, Nigel, it may not be to you, but to anybody who can read do the words accept, of the treaties on the page, do you accept? It is a fact. Do you accept that we voted to leave? Uh, well. That's, the the truth on, is, come on, we did, didn't we? Yeah, the, the truth is, there was not an actual proposition it was for to leave. leave. No, but there wasn't a proposition for leave on the ballot, Nigel. This has been the big problem. Well, I think this is the weakness of your argument. And the reason know, why we I, voted to leave. No, but the reason why I, I want to see uh, another referendum is so that when we see the actual leave proposition, which wasn't there two years ago, because all of those of you on the leave side had a different idea of what it actually meant, you've just said, for example, that staying in the single market and the customs union doesn't involve leaving. That's what you've said, isn't well, it? Well, if Mrs May... That's not, if Mrs. That's what you've if just may, said. If Mrs May keeps us in those things, we haven't basically yeah, left. But, but there are loads of people who voted Leave two years ago who thought that they were staying in no, the there single aren't. market. And no, there, aren't. there were polls afterwards that showed that more than half of David all Leave Cameron voters sent a leaflet thought to that ev- more than half of all Leave voters, Nigel, thought that Andrew, staying in the single Andrew, market and the customs union Andrew, would follow a vote to leave the European Union. We were told, I'm afraid that's a fact. We were told by your party, the Labour Party, and the Tory party, during the referendum, and what's worse, in the general election the year later that the vote would be respected. The government documentation that went through every door in this land, and I objected to the nine million quid being spent, told us that leaving involved leaving the single market and the customs union, and we were told no, it did not say we that. will abide. No, 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 that, we document, will abide that document did not by, say that, Nigel. It couldn't it have been not, clearer. It did not say. We will the document that went out from, Hold on. The document, let's get some facts here. The, the document that went, which went out of every vote in the country did not say we would leave the single market and the customs union if you vote to leave the European Union. It, it, it did not say it. Clear we 
we'll leave in the single and, market. Uh, Theresa May is negotiating a treaty at the moment which would involve leaving the European Union. But you've just told us on this programme that, in your view, that doesn't constitute leaving. I think you've ju- therefore just made well, the case well, for if, a referendum. Because if, you can't even agree amongst yourselves yes, what you leaving le- the European Union means. No, no, no. no. So Mrs. if you can't agree, then the people the should, have, should arbitrate Brexit. on this big the subject. The problem is the Prime Minister, and on that we're agreed. That was no doubt. Uh, finally, before we go to the public, and that's the great thing about LBC, is the public, uh, and what they say is far more important than what you and I think on this, ultimately, and ultimately it is, um, Andy Burnham, Labour Mayor of Manchester, said uh, that if a second referendum was held, it would likely lead to civil disorder. Do you think that's worth the risk? Well, he didn't actually say that. No, he, 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 he said he, that society was very divided. Well, of course it's divided, because, Nigel, you've, you've been very, very successful in, in dividing it over, over recent years. You've put a big, extremely divisive issue in front of the people, and all credit to you, in the referendum two years ago, you got a majority for a proposition on the ballot paper that we should leave the European Union. The big problem we've been wrestling with ever since is that no one knows what leave means. And as it's come to be defined, a lot of the people who voted leave are now starting to say, hey, I didn't vote for that. There were lots of people on this march in London yesterday who said to me that they'd voted leave two years ago. But now that they realise that it meant that uh, our trade is going to be trashed, that there's going to be a border in Northern Ireland, really? that this what, meant really? that freedom that? of movement... Why is that? Because once you have different customs regimes between the Republic of Ireland and Northern Ireland, you have to have customs checks, but we, which but, means border but arrangements. But we already have a different uh, excise regime. We managed to collect, we managed to collect those taxes without having. But we're a talking about a wholly different order of border and customs controls that will be necessary if we leave the Isn't European Union. Isn't the truth of it? You're looking so for problems, not solutions. No, really, on, no, on, I can assure you. I can assure you, Nigel. If you go to Ireland, they do not think that this is an invented problem. They're living with this day in, day out. The problem well, I was of with, uh, the problem of a prospect of a border, the, I was with and the they're deeply deeply anxious and worried about it. I was with the former um, Northern Irish Secretary yesterday, uh, I was with a Northern Irish MP, I was a yeah. trade expert, and you know, the real solution to this actually would be a simple free trade deal along the Canada lines would mean there'd be no duties to collect anyway. Look, I tell you what, you and I will never agree on what the referendum was about, or, or but, even no, Nigel, on have, what the result was. Yeah, but, and in, I, and in, that's the, but in the past, you have agreed that a second referendum might be a good idea, Nigel. No, I've agreed if we get a second referendum, we have to win it. But, 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 but you won't tell me me what you want on the ballot do, paper when we have this referendum. I'm still waiting for the answer, Nigel. If, what if is it succeed, you want on the ballot paper? If you succeed with your um, campaign, which I don't think you will, because I think time's running out, but let's say you do succeed, and if leave wins again, would you still keep on campaigning? Uh, well, if, uh, if Will the, you ever give up? Well, it, the question is whether there's a proposition on the ballot paper which can be implemented. If there is a leave ah. proposition on the ballot paper that can be implemented, then of course I would accept that if there's a majority would you? for it. Yes, of course I would, because I'm a Democrat. The problem with the referendum you, two years ago but is you there don't was... Like, but you don't like referendums. Uh, uh, I've said that the reason why we need to have a referendum in this case is because we did have the one two years ah. ago. We're in, a unique, we're in a unique situation, which, uh, let's say, let, let me be frank, I hope doesn't recur again. But if there's a, a, a proposition that could be implemented, fine. The problem two years ago is that you were saying one thing, Boris Johnson was saying another, Michael Gave was saying a we third thing, and, 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 then of course, and then of course we have Theresa May who comes along with yet another proposition called Checkers. And do you think any of your listeners could explain Checkers to you and me? Well, I mean, you we know what? Offer, and, and, and checkers, of... checkers now commands less than ten percent support yeah, in the country. But, but that is the government of the country is negotiating that, Andrew, and that is what I the Prime Minister you one tells thing. us is, is the lead Gove, proposition. So we're in a bit Michael of a crisis Gove, at the moment. Boris Johnson and myself were all absolutely clear. A vote to leave is a vote to leave. Let I tell you what we're going to do. We're going to go to Heathrow. We're going to speak to Matthew. Matthew, good morning. Morning, Nigel, and uh, morning, Lord Adonis. I mean, I, I was a Remainer, but now I have accepted we're going to leave. And I think, you, you know, everyone has got to not be Remainers. I mean, uh, we've already, Nigel has made us now put the brakes on the EU, but we mustn't put ourselves in reverse and have another referendum. So Matthew is, you know, he's a Remain voter who accepts the democratic res- result. W- what's your message to Matthew? Well, well, Matthew, wouldn't you actually like to see the terms on which we're leaving is my big question to you, because the terms on which we're leaving will make a fundamental difference to your whole future and the future of your family. And when I speak to people up and down the country at the moment, what they say to me is when they see the terms, when they know what's going to happen to our trade, our jobs, the rights of British citizens who live on the European continent at the moment, all of those things, they want to have their say. Why should they just uh, hand that away when the gravity of the issues is so great? Matthew? 
I, I do agree to you. We've got to see the terms, and that's why we've got to give Theresa May a chance. Everyone's got to support us just to see what the deal is. Parliament will then vote on it. If it gets rejected, I mean, the only answer then will be another general election. It could end up suspending the Article 50, well, no, Nigel won't like. I won't be happy I, with that, I, no, I, but that's I, what I, Andrew I, wants, I, of course. I'm up for those things, Matthew. <laughs> I, 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 I'm, up, I'm up for Parliament rejecting the deal and there being another election. But let's be clear, another election isn't a panacea, because the political parties would have to say in that election, what are you going to do on Brexit? And my view is, if there was an election, the first thing that should be in the Labour manifesto is a commitment to a people's vote as a way of resolving this Brexit crisis. Gosh, it could so go on forever. It. Matthew, thank you for your call. By the way, you, you mentioned what people say to you going up and down the country. Let me tell you what people say to me going up, going up and down the country. Overwhelmingly, they say, just get on with it. Yeah, they're not interested. They're, they're not interested in the details. They're busy running their businesses, doing their jobs, bringing up their kids, paying their mortgages. The overwhelming view is just get on yeah, with but it. Nigel, do you what, what is do it? you understand but, why? But Nigel, what is it that leaving. you want to get on with? Leaving. Yes, but you haven't been able to tell me no, this leaving. morning what, what leaving means. Me, I, I you haven't you told me. I've tell asked you, what it you means. about five times, I'll tell you what it means. You haven't not told being us. governed by a foreign court. I'll tell you what it means, not paying over huge sums of money. I'll tell you what it means, not so, having laws made somewhere else that apply to us. Hold on. It's quite simple. Hold on, it's not simple at all. You just said not paying huge sums of money. So you, yes. would, you would pay some money to the EU, would you? How much? I think we should call it quits. I, I think oh, zero is about right. Oh, so you uh, don't want they, to pay any money? Well, so, well, so, well, why would I? Well, because your pension, Nigel. Well, £73,000 a year do, in what, your no, pension when depends leave, upon a deal oh, on leaving the European what? Union. Just show, you must read a lot of gutter press, I'm if really, you believe I, I, that. I, I'm really worried about your old age, Nigel. I don't want you to be a burden on the state. I promise you. And there's a real danger at the moment if there's no deal when we leave the European Union If you believe trash you. If you believe trash like that, you'll believe anything. Lauren right. is a new caller from King's Cross in London. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, yes, Lord Adonis, you say you're a Democrat. Does that mean that you think people have the right to elect their own governments as we do in this country? Of course it does. Yes, of course it does. Well, that's, the, that's the essence then, of democracy. Then, okay, so then I have you a, 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 quite a question. Can you tell me exactly when the uh, elected... Uh, officials of this country uh, gave the people a vote about abrogating their elected duties off to the EU. Mm. Uh, well, we did sign a treaty which went. Wait, who signed we, we, the treaty? Well, uh, actually, the Prime Minister in the 1970s signed okay, a treaty well, which I'm went to a referendum you, in 1975. I'm asking you, so. when did the people? give politicians the right to abrogate that responsibility. Well, well, they didn't abrogate the responsibilities. Parliament agreed a treaty, which the people then also supported in a referendum in 1975. After we've been no, taken that so, referendum was on the EEC. That was on joining a market block. Uh, no, that that's not true not at all. It was a community. It was a community. Right to legislate our laws and to pass taxes. Uh, it, I'm afraid it did give those powers. That is all in the well, treaty in the 1970s. Not, well, and that was, that was agreed to I'm by sorry, Parliament but that's and a referendum. That's not what was presented to the public. In fact, at the time, because I remember that time, at that time, people who said the EU were going to take political control, they're going to do this, they're going to do that, were called fantasists. Yes. We were joining a common market bloc. The question on the ballot paper in 1975 is, do you want to join the European no, it, Community? No, it was not. It was. No, no, it was Brackets, not. the common no, market. Stop. It was. It was. Stop. The question uh, on the ballot paper in 1975 Lord is, Adonis, do you want to join stop, the European Community? Can we stop, please? That's true. Can um, we stop, please? You're wrong. No, I'm afraid you're wrong, Nigel. We, can I mean, we, we can, please we can, get... Can you're, we you're please, wrong. Lord Adonis, accept you've got this wrong? No. Lauren is right. Lauren is right. What happened was the Heath government, the Tories, without a mandate... Took us into uh, no, the EEC. With the consent of Parliament, Nigel. With the consent without, of Parliament. With without the consent of a Parliament, mandate, because they broke their own manifesto with, with in the, 1970. No, that's not true either. With the consent of Parliament, they, they joined and the European Union. And then, Union. after we joined, and we joined on the 1st of January 1973, a referendum was held in 1975 because the Labour Party promised it. So the question wasn't, do you want to join? We joined already. Ah, but, but uh, no, well, do you want to stay in? Yes, but the, the point is... It's a is, very different question. Well, no, the point is still exactly the same, because Parliament had the absolute democratic right inside the United Kingdom to join the European uh, community, as it, as it was then in 1972-3. It, it behaved absolutely according to the law. Parliament no. then also decided that it wanted to hold a referendum, and, 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 which is a situation very similar to the one we're in now. And Parliament let me pick could Lauren's decide point what up. to do with Brexit, Let me pick Lauren's point up. a referendum. Lauren's point, if, if I can extend it a bit, she talked about what happened then. When Labour were in power, 
you signed the Amsterdam Treaty, you signed the Nice Treaty, you signed the Lisbon Treaty. Three treaties were signed under Blair and Brown, all of them transferring further powers to Brussels, uh, giving the European Union greater identity, forming a European External Action Service. Why at no point during that did Labour politicians give us the choice to have a referendum? Because all of those treaties, Nigel, were agreed by Parliament. We're a parliamentary democracy in this country. They're all agreed by Parliament. They were agreed by our proper democratic procedures. Now, what then happened was, with you campaigning, and you have an absolute right to campaign on it, with you campaigning hard on it, David Cameron agreed to this in-out referendum. The in-out referendum was n- is not necessitated by our democratic processes at all. So, so, it was, so, it was, it so was a decision to go sort for this out, Do you know, I'd be perfectly happy for Parliament to sort it out if if it weren't for the fact that we did have the referendum two years ago, it's that that as a judgment call, because these are all judgment calls, leads me to think that Parliament doing it on its own is probably not enough. I mean, it has the legal power to do it, it has the democratic power and right to do it, but if Parliament itself takes the view, and I think it probably will in this circumstance, that the right thing is for the people to reach a judgment on Mrs May's Brexit well, terms, because nobody knew what these Brexit I terms tell you what, were. Two I years tell you ago, what, most of us would fine. say, most of us would say we had that vote. Let's go to Dominic in Colchester. Dominic, good morning. Put your question, please, to Lord Adonis. Hi, um, Lord Adonis. If we agreed to stay in the European Union, we had another referendum, would, what would we do if we didn't get our rebate? Uh, we would um, get our rebate, because we would stay in the European Union on exactly the same terms as now. No, we wouldn't. We There's wouldn't. a new financial framework being uh, negotiated. No, no, no we stay so, on exactly the so, same terms so, as now. So, so, so we wouldn't, because we would. it's already been negotiated no. a lot of the terms of our exit. If you look no. in the yeah, May we, 2019 but, budget, yeah, what we, they've agreed has assumed that we have left. Yeah, but, Therefore, they would have to renegotiate their own division of, of funds. They would have to, we'd have to renegotiate how many MEPs that we've got. No, no, none of that's true. We'd stay in on exactly the same basis as now if, if, if we oh, so, stay in. So, so they've all got to go back. They've been having meeting after meeting and after meeting, agreeing what's going to happen. Yeah, but no, they've agreed, they've divis- divided everything up. And now all of that, they've got to bin it and yes, renegotiate. That's right. re- well, yes. they wouldn't do it. Yes, they would do that, we, because we, we, they, have, we have an absolute legal right to, to withdraw our it, notice made, to leave the European Union. They've already made it Union. quite clear that they will not agree to our rebate. No, that's right? not, that's not already, the case at all. There are two, no, well, I'm afraid uh, that, that's so, completely, so, what you so just said is completely two, incorrect. Are you saying that no senior politicians in Europe have said that we will not get our re- rebate? Provided we stay in the European I, Union without no. leaving. If we leave no, no, next if March, we stay, if we, we leave next March, stay, then of course we would leave the rebate. Dominic's point, st- Dominic's point is a very powerful one, we which would, is which is there's huge resentment about what they call the British check. Um, and, and the year's extension that Mrs Mays agreed to takes us into the next seven-year spending round, whereas Dominic says there is no provision for a rebate at all. Getting that written back in would be impossible. No, I don't accept any of that at all. We've uh, had the rebate now since we joined, actually, and then Margaret Thatcher got a larger rebate in the 1980s. And Tony Blair gave it away. Uh, no, he, no he, he, there was a wholly new financial framework which included a substantial part of the rebate but of course we were expanding the European Union at the time. We would keep the rebate provided we don't leave. What would be the real nightmare is to leave next Next March, and then to seek to reapply to join the European Union, which I think is, is very likely okay. we would seek Dominic, to because of the damage to our economy, pa- powerful, and then our, then our rebate would be lost. Powerful point, Dominic. Now, to hold a referendum in this country, the Electoral Commission say needs at least nine months, at least nine months of preparation. You know, a question's got to be agreed, and all the rest of it. Do you accept that actually? There isn't going to be a referendum before the end of March next year. Well, they, they could be, but if but how it, uh, they could be, if if Parliament were to decide one in the next before Christmas, then it could be held before. But next the Electoral March. Commission, I mean, I yeah, mean, the I Electoral mean, Commission I mean, is subject said, to law, and but, and but Parliament said it itself. takes longer than that. Yeah, but the, that's if you followed the uh, Electoral Commission's extremely bureaucratic procedures. But Parliament itself, of course, can override the Electoral Commission. It has an absolute right to do that, and it could set up an expedited procedure. But equally, we could extend the period uh, which we have for Article 50 uh, in order to hold a referendum. This is the real campaign, isn't which, it? Of course, I, I, this which is I, the real which, campaign. Which, which, Come which, on, this which, is what you've been fighting be for all the way through. Yeah, I'd be strongly in favour of that, Nigel, <laughs> extending the period so that people have longer in order to assess okay. the consequences Folks, of Brexit. I've been saying them. it here for months. The real campaign isn't for a second referendum. 
referendum because they know that's not going to happen in the short term. It has always been to suspend no, Article 50. I only, want to extend it. I only want to extend it, Nigel, let's be clear, for the purposes of holding a referendum. I do uh, not want to extend it just for the purposes oh, of, I, of spinning out uh, well, for the fruitless well, negotiations well, on the suit, part of Theresa well, May. Well, Mrs May might right. agree with you. After all, this week she agreed to a further year's mm. extension on, on the implementation mm. period, as she calls it, at the cost of a further £20 billion. Yeah, well, I, don't, I, don't, I, I don't agree with that either. I think being in a state of perpetual limbo isn't the right thing for this country. No, and it does add to uncertainty. Cl- we should be in a clear situation. Yeah. But we do, of course, it does take a while to uh, hold a referendum, and if there literally isn't enough time before the end of next March, but we've decided as yeah. a parliament and as a people that that's what we want to do, then clearly we need the time necessary to do that. I'm going to go to Jennifer in Ealing. Jennifer, good morning. Good morning, Nigel. Lord Adonis is here. Please yeah, ask your question. Um, uh, first of all, I'd like to tell him I knew exactly what I was voting for, so we'll get that one out of the way. And the second thing is, what makes you think, Lord Adonis, that, um, that leaving the EU, EU is only bad for us? Why don't they, you know, we, why won't our planes fly? Why won't, why won't we have any drugs? Why won't our citizens be, is it only our citizens that our jobs are going to be affected? It's, it's going to affect the EU equally as much as it's going to affect us because a lot of our drugs come from India and China anyway, so there's one thing out the way. We can say, well, our, your planes can't right. land in no, Heathrow. Jennifer, and, it's, it's absolutely fair point. Uh, well, can I, can I say to Jennifer, I do think it's, it's going to be bad news for the European Union at large as well. I, I'm not in any way um, uh, minimising the impact it's going to have on Europe as a whole. But there are 27 of them, and there's one of us. So if you just look at the the balance of... of uh, so common of, sense of, of says power. the planes go on flying, doesn't well, it? Uh, of no, course. Uh, well, no, the common sense is that there has to be a deal. There has to be a deal. And uh, I, I believe that there would be a deal. Yes. What I've been inviting you to say, Nigel, is what would your well, deal be? Well, I want to double because well, actually, we can't just leave without a deal. No, no, of course, neighbours so, neighbours have to agree yeah. things. Of course, that's absolutely right. What there doesn't have to be is a very bad trade deal. Yes, yeah, so, uh, so Nigel, what's your answer to the Irish border? Well, it's very interesting, isn't it? We already have excise duties being collected north and south of the border. We already have a different currency, uh, different income tax rates. Uh, we also, of course, have different corporation tax so rates. You, so you'd be happy and, with, and, different, and with different with different duties. And it's you, worth yeah. noting. Yeah, Nigel, you'd be happy with different customs the, duties, the, would you, the, the, between Northern well, Ireland well, and the Republic I, of Ireland? I don't, I, I don't think we need them, but if we do have them, there are examples all over the world, such as Detroit, with that bridge to Canada, where goods go back right. and forth without any single checks at all. That's not that's not the case. There are lots of checks there between, are, between Canada and the United are, States. You look at that bridge at Detroit, no, it works there, perfectly. There are, uh, uh, the there, Irish uh, border has been... And, and let's be clear... You know, that the Anglo-Irish agreement, the Belfast agreement, barely mentioned the border as an issue. The EU had nothing to do with it. This has been put up by Barnier, and I'm afraid Theresa May's bought into it. Listen, that, Andrew, that, that, we isn't, are... that isn't the view of people in, in Ireland, Nigel. I have to tell you that. That is not well, their view. I... Their view is that it would be very dangerous to leave without uh, a proper agreement in place which keeps Northern Ireland in the customs union and the single market well, because it well, will to, lead to new well, customs well, checks. To, and, and that is the trick that's being used that Theresa May's bought into. One thing we can agree on, we need better leadership in this country because at the moment it's pretty poor Andrew thank you for coming in thank you for taking those calls uh, after the news we will keep this conversation going you're listening to the Sunday edition of the Nigel Farage show here on LBC and it's now 10 30 and time for the news with Philip Krisikos well Lord Adonis has gone um, it's now you and me I'm asking did yesterday's march strengthen the case for a second referendum. You know, I've marched before in London. I marched on the countryside march to try and stop the Labour Party putting through the hunting ban. There were 406,000 of us that marched. How do I know that? Because they had a counter actually individually counting people at the end. I've no idea how many turned up yesterday. Uh, The organisers said it was 670,000. I've no idea whether it was a quarter of a million. I, I don't know. But does it really make any difference how many turned up? Uh, that really is the question. A million marched, of course, a year after that, against going to war in Iraq. And I didn't go on that march, although I wanted to, and I didn't feel necessarily I'd have been all that safe going on it. Uh, but that made no difference either. So Alistair Campbell, the great spinmeister of Tony Blair, who was the one that ignored the countryside march and ignored the Iraq march, uh, now somehow seems to think that everybody should listen to what happened yesterday. I don't think they will. On Twitter, I get, uh, Adonis says it wasn't made clear, but ask him to make clear exactly what Remain were voting for. Do you know, I wonder how many people in that crowd yesterday, if I told them that the elected government of Italy, who'd put forward a budget to have it rejected by the unelected Mr Juncker last week, I wonder how many of them understand just how undemocratic this European 
clubs becoming? I suspect very, very few. Nigel, does Adonis and others who've had to remain know that remain means that because EU leaders have said that all EU countries in a single market must adopt the euro, a single finance minister, a single foreign defence policy, and no one voted for that. Anthony, the EU is attempting to deepen, to strengthen, to move forward with its project every single day of the week. Let's go to Exeter and speak to Rudy. Rudy, good morning to you. Good morning, Nigel. I'm actually in London at the Ned today, actually. Oh, OK. So I'm not that far, far from you today. Um, the way I look at it is, there was only 500 or 600,000. That's not even 1% of the 17.4 million that voted. So I think it's actually insignificant that the march went ahead because it makes no difference because they don't speak for the other 17.4 million. No, I mean, it, I mean, it was a very, it was a very <laughs> well-funded and very well-organised event. I'll give them credit for that. And, uh, you know, we know that Mr. Soros and others helped with them. And they did, I mean, to be fair to them, they put on a good show in terms of an event. Uh, but I, Rudy, I don't think it makes any difference at all. Well, do you know the thing is, Nigel, I don't know about you, but the more they push for us to have a second referendum, the more it makes me want to not vote because I think... Why, why are they pushing so much? There's obviously a hidden agenda behind it, you know, and that makes me even more suspicious that they keep pushing it. And I don't know if you agree with me, but they keep saying that Brexit is a mess, but it's because of people like them and Gina Miller that put obstacles in front of course the mess. Had they got on with it from the beginning, we wouldn't um, have had a problem. Uh, there is some truth in that, Rudy, although I think the real problem is the Prime Minister, uh, who was chosen yeah, who was chosen to pursue this bizarre path that almost no one seems to support. And I was told yesterday, someone said to me that indecisive people, and meaning Mrs May, once indecisive people have made a decision, you can't budge them, which is a very interesting sort of psychological comment. Rudy, thank you. David is calling from Oxford. David, good morning. Oh, hi, Nigel. Um, I suppose the point, I was, the point I was making is that um, at the time of the referendum, through my door, I had lots of literature from Boat Leave saying, you know, how good Norway and Switzerland were and wouldn't you like to be like Norway and Switzerland? And, and there, was, there, was, there was a number of leaflets saying that. And I do feel that at the time of the referendum, certainly people in... Um, certainly in Oxford anyway, people were mis misled into thinking that Brexit would be this kind of what could be de defined as a soft Brexit. Um, and there would, be, there would be, you know, it'd be like Norway and Switzerland, for example. Um, and that was certainly the emphasis on the, on the leaflets I got through my door. Um, now, and of course, um, you know, Norway and Switzerland are, you know, custom union, single market. So when I, when I voted... Or variants um, of, yeah. Yeah, when I voted, I, I, I was I was on the fence to be honest. Um, I was kind of like um, uh, 50, fifty-five, forty-five. So I did vote Remain, but I was very much on the fence. Now, what I feel is that um, certainly people like yourself, no disrespect, but have almost you know have gone for this what what could be defined as um, you know a, a harder Brexit. I know you're going to say, well, Brexit is Brexit, but. It could be defined as a harder Brexit. And I feel that, um, mm. that I don't think there is a mandate for this harder Brexit. Um, and I did go on the People's Vote yesterday because I feel that um, people were... Um, but people didn't have all the information at the time of the referendum. I, I think I'm pretty informed. And but, I da well, David, your point about Norway and Switzerland... Here. I mean, yeah, you know, Norway and Switzerland are the two richest European countries, and they're not full members of the European Union, yeah. but they are very tied to European Union rules. But I would just remind you of this. I mean, the Vote Leave campaign, uh, their slogan was Take Back Control. Uh, yeah. my, my slogan with Leave.eu is We Want Our Country Back. And the, yeah. one, th and the one thing, certainly that both of those campaigns emphasised very strongly was the supremacy of our courts, the, the, the independence of our own lawmaking <coughs> process, and taking back control of our borders. And none of those things could you do with a Swiss or Norwegian well, model then, as they currently are. Well, in greatest respect, greatest respect, and why did... But because, because Vote Leave was trying to be all things to all people, it was trying to get marginal... A place like Oxford, where, which is largely, you know, quite a Remain vote, they were trying to get the marginal voters mm. to, vote, to vote Leave. Well, and, and therefore there was, you know, it, there was a lot of talk about Norway and Switzerland. And, and people don't... Even I, I'm pretty, pretty informed, but I didn't know all the technical issues about, you know, about, um, you know, the single market customs union at the time. So I do feel there was that kind of, like, let's... You know, I mean, I mean, I don't know whether the the the, the leaflets they would have got, say, in Lincolnshire, would have been 
um, would have been the same. I, I, I would. Isn't that? I mean, David, isn't that the same for every single election, whether they're general elections or referendums? You're I mean, right. You know, but, but I, think I, I know the that sounds is, cynical, but but no, no, you're right. You're right. And I think I think the thing is, yeah, I think the. Um, the, of course, you know, we, I get the fact that 52% of people voted leave, but also you can't say, um, as um, um, that guy from Money Supermarket said, I can't remember his name, he was on Question Time, I what's his name, um, um, but not everybody that voted leave voted to, voted for, the, for exactly the same reasons. You know, there were people that were very hard, you know, people like yourself and people that wore on the fence. And yeah. Remainers as well, David. Yeah, I, of, course, I, of I, course. I mean, the of number course. of people I've met who say, Nigel, I voted Remain, I hate the European Union, I think the whole thing's appalling, but I've got a big mortgage and I was very frightened by what George Osborne said. So you can argue with all... David, let me just finish this call by asking you, you, you are, are yeah. you now convinced that a second referendum would somehow solve all of this? I, I think I, I think that if we had... A, the problem is, I think the problem is, I don't believe proper democracy is about winner takes all. Um, and I don't believe that, you know, that, 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 you, know, uh, you, know uh, you know, I don't believe it's um, saying, oh, you lost, get over it. I think that proper democracy is about having, is about saying, what are the, you know, it's, it's trying to get a, a, a situation where at least, and not, probably, probably not yourself, but at least 80% of people mm. can be happy with it. And that's the problem. <laughs> I think if you go through this hard Brexit thing saying, you lost, we, we, we won, then people are going to, then, then it just, it just, I get really angry about that because I, I don't, I think that, for example, if, you know, for example, um, people are more informed now. Also, you've got the demographic, demographic issues where you've got a lot of younger people that can now vote, uh, a million and a half that, that couldn't vote at the time of the referendum. And you don't need to be a statistical genius to work out that even on the demographics, that there isn't necessarily going to be this, you know, you, you can't be sure that, that there but is the trouble is, David, Brexit. The trouble is, David, that, that, you know, some polling put out by YouGov last week showing that if there was a second referendum, and, you know, whether leave one again or remain one, I mean, still only a quarter of the country think it would settle the issue. So, you know, the real problem here is, if we had a second referendum, what damage does that do to people's faith and trust in the whole democratic system? When we were told, David, this was our once-in-a-lifetime chance. But what about... OK, you know, I understand what you're saying, but I think we need to have... Uh, and I, I, I get it's difficult. We need to have some kind of solution. I'd be quite happy having... A, I mean, I, you know, I get the fact that you're in Germany, for example... Um, uh, for example, they have, I, I'm not an expert, you probably know more than me, but um, for example, if you're a, a tradesman in Germany, you get like, it's easier for them to, to, to not be undercut by foreign foreign um, competitors, for example. Yeah, so and, yeah and, 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 and there are oddities here, like our social security system is much more open, yeah, etc. Yeah. I, mean, I mean, David, I'm listening to what you're saying. I'm not convinced that a second referendum solves anything. I thank you for your call. Scott on Facebook says, when people say we weren't informed what what we were voting for, well, they still voted, didn't they? John says, how dare those marchers yesterday call their event the People's March? The vast majority of people voted to leave. Well, it was a majority. It wasn't vast. It was big enough. Uh, but John, uh, <laughs> You know, it's, it's Alistair Campbell, isn't it? He is the spinner. He was Blair's great spinner. So he uses language in a way to suit him. And suddenly they're the party that... They're, they're the group that are for referendums and for democracy, when the truth is they've resisted them for their entire careers. We had the people's vote, would be my answer. Fred is calling from Teddington. Hi, Fred. Hello, uh, Nigel. Look, if you called a march next Sunday or Saturday, you'd get as many people there as uh, last Saturday. It doesn't resolve anything, seeing people marching in the street. The one thing that really needs to be done now to shut down the people who are complaining about the referendum outcome is for people like you to propose the kind of imaginative new strategies that would be uh, free for Britain to pursue once we're out. And the reason why I'm stressing this is that, for instance, yesterday, the Telegraph revealed that one of the things that the EU is trying to get us to agree to yep. as part of any kind of settlement is that we would continue to comply with their tax regime. That would be disastrous for yes. Britain if we were locked into that kind of condition. And we might as well remain as part of the EU if we come out uh, under terms that where we agree to comply with their tax policy. And that is the problem with what, with what Mrs May is doing. Mrs May is taking us in a direction, Fred, where we would be tied to virtually everything. It would be Brexit in name only. And the vision, the vision is outside the European Union, a United Kingdom, 
that genuinely becomes competitive. Fred, I thank you. You're listening to the Sunday edition of the Nigel Farage Show here on LBC, and it is now... 10.46. A people's vote doesn't make sense. I didn't vote leave because I thought we would necessarily get a great deal from the EU. I also didn't vote based on immigration. I voted leave because I want my child to live in a global economy where my country's trade isn't defined for me. I voted because I believe in the long-term benefit to the country. There are pluses and negatives to both leave and remain. However, for me, the long-term benefits of leave are more attractive. Well, there are lots of reasons why people do things. Uh, but where I really, really am at issue with Lord Adonis and the others is they constantly keep trying to pretend that people didn't know what they were voting for. And they very clearly did. Joy says on Facebook, what a load of rubbish. I got nothing through my door apart from the £9 million government pamphlet that very clearly said leave men leave. However, there are strong passions on the other side. Lewis is on the line from Thornton Heath and was a marcher yesterday. Or, or Lewis, was it more of a shuffle than a march? Um, well, perhaps more on the march later, if, if, you, if, if you'd like, Nigel. Sure. Um, what I wanted to write on cue with what you were just saying uh, yeah. in the run-up there is you had a debate with um, Andrew Adonis earlier. Uh, his yeah. message was that the reason uh, for the need for... A, it's not a second referendum. Well, of course it is. On, ...on whatever deal was because the, 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 the paper said when, that we voted on in 2016, should Britain leave the European Union? Uh, yes or no? Yeah. That was it. But there were very, very mixed messages about what leaving the European... Because that, as Andrew said, could mean anything. You were in denial that there were any mixed messages on the Leave side. However, I mean, the person... Well, well very mixed messages, Lewis, on the Stay side, weren't there? Hang on, let, let, let me make my you know. points, because uh, you have a long time on air and I have very little. Uh, Aaron Banks said, increasingly the Norway option looks like the best for the UK. So that implies full membership of single market uh, customs union. You yourself said, wouldn't it be terrible if we were really like Norway and Switzerland? Really? They're rich, they're happy, they're self-governing. Yeah. So that would imply, you know, before the referendum, anybody want, would say anything to, to, to make people think that it wasn't such a big deal. Now, I don't think that these are lies that anybody said. There's plenty more quotes of Leave campaigners. I don't think it's lies. That, that, that's unfair. They're not lies. It's the, the simple fact is nobody had any idea of how complex our involvement was with Europe and how difficult it would be to unpick. That why, that's why it's, it's slightly unfair to throw all the mud at Theresa May. I mean, she was left uh, a terrible hand to deal with. But, but Lewis, and these arguments go both ways. I mean, Sir Nick Clegg, now off to, of course, California to get his big job with Facebook. You know, Nick Clegg uh, denied that he was blue in the face that a European army wasn't being built. Um, you know, you know, I mean, I mean, I mean you could argue, that, you could argue that, that, that Britain, mixed messages... Yeah, but, but, but as Andrew said to you, if there had been any systemic change to our involvement with the European Union, such as moving to to a single army and, and all those other things... It's happening. Then, then, then but, yeah, how about... How about it, 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 Turkey was supposed to be joining... Yes, that, that's, that right. Great that's right. That's yeah, right, that's well, right. I mean, Turkey... That? We well, 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 so, here's, so here's the point, Lewis. You can argue there are variables of argument on the Leave no, side, so, I mean, but there were equally... The argument's, about, the argument's not about rerunning the referendum, and I, and I think if there is a, a second vote, it should respect the original in that uh, the, 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 the question should simply be... Go on. Uh, whatever... Whatever deal Theresa May gets, uh, yes or no, if it's a no, then we vote, do you want to leave on what you keep saying, WTO rules, because that would be the no deal scenario, or should we stay where we are? But would that be that two referendums, that, Lewis? That, that, that would give the Leave campaign two bites at the cherry, and that gives people, you know, far, that respects the original referendum result. It is not a repeat of, of the re original referendum. It is because, as Andrew Adonis was quite clearly saying, but you wouldn't listen to him, but that uh, the original European, leaving the European Union back in 2016 could mean anything to anyone. And there are so many quotes to, to, to back that up. Um, uh, what Owen Patterson said, only a madman would actually leave the market. I mean, those messages... Lewis, Lewis were you can go back. You can go anyone. back as long as you want through politicians' histories. But this Don't... is such an important thing. It is impossible. It is not like a general election where where we vote every four or five years. And, and but are you, so Lewis, are you proposing two referendums? Do is unpickable. Are this you proposing is two a referendums? Really, really important 
uh, Lewis, thing for Lewis. Our, for people's future, and it is essential. Let me just try this again. Let not, me try this no, again. We're not, we're not voting again on on the original right. referendum. So you want, to, want vote to vote on the deal? On yes or no? How we're leaving, Lewis? Sorry? Quickly, one more time. You want a referendum yeah. on the deal? Yes or no? Right on the deal. Fine. Yes. So, on the deal. Right. So not if we on vote, the original referendum. so if we vote no to the deal, what then? Then it should be, as I said, I should explain that. Yeah. You, yeah. Then we are left because we have we have simple. You uh, people have been saying on your side that there is nothing wrong with WTO rules. Yep. And if that is what people really want, then fine, that should be one of the. All options. right, fine. Well, I think your referendum will be a lot fairer than Lord Adonis's. Lewis, I thank you very much. And tell me, what was the atmosphere like on the march? Oh, we were very, 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 very pleasant. You know, every the families, everybody having a good time. Lots it of was, kids, uh, I was told. Lots and lots of kids. Yeah, lovely. Yeah, interesting. Lovely interesting. And Lewis, the was out, of course. There All you right. go, Pleasure Lewis. You, I've allowed you to talk up the ranch. There we are. I'm being balanced. I'm being fair. Lewis, thank you. Janet is calling from Sunderland. Hi, Janet. Nigel, hi. I just wanted to say, you know, most of my life, I've lived in the northeast of England. Uh huh. <laughs> We've lost her. Let's go to Bournemouth and speak to Rob, a new caller to the show. Good morning, Rob. Hi, morning, Nigel. How are you? So, big march in London yesterday. Does it change things? No, because how many people uh, marched on uh, Stop the War for Iraq? Is that, what, a million and a half or something like that? Big Did number, it stop yeah. the war in Iraq? Nope. No, it did hell. So, my, my point is, is those people that were, were marching yesterday, I think probably about 80% of them was bussed in by trade unions, I do believe, you know. So, what does that show you? That people will only go if they're paid to go. Well, there was a lot of money spent on coaches, you're absolutely right. Um, and the National Union of Students were very prominent in this as well. Um, but regardless whether they were bussed in or, uh, or not, there were still a lot of people there, weren't there? Yeah, there was. But we've already had a, se uh, a second vote on the uh, on the leave argument because obviously we had the vote to leave the EU, which mm. everyone knows about. So they yep. need to go into that. Yep. Then uh, a year later, we called a general election, Absolutely. and I do believe in the Conservative manifesto and the Labour manifesto, it was saying we will leave the EU and the customs uh, union. Okay, so that equates to like eighty percent. Eighty five, I think. Yeah. Yeah, eighty five. Eight, so we've already had a vote. So wh how many more votes do we need? You know, what do we do? Keep voting to well, uh, go raw or something? The, the thing is, know? Rob, I mean, <laughs> the thing is that, that, that the globalists, those that are building the European Union who want greater global government on all levels, they never, ever give up. And they've been used to bullying countries like Denmark uh, and like the Irish into, into voting a second time. Um, I'm going to go back to Sunderland and see if that phone line's working with Janet. Hi, Janet. Hi, Nigel. Yeah, um, I just wanted to say that I, I live in the Labour area, uh, OK, mm. and all my life, um, my vote has counted for nothing because Labour always get in. Yes. Now, this referendum gave me a voice. Uh -huh. I went out and I voted, and I felt empowered when my vote counted for something. Yes. Now, if they repeat this referendum, I will despair because it means that... I'm disempowered, and my voice counts for nothing because they just ignore it when they get the answer they don't want. Janet, I and think I think you're right. I think there are millions of people like you, and indeed millions of people who've never voted in their lives before, who were turning up at polling stations saying, "What do we do?" and and voting both sides. But probably, probably it was those voters that made the Leave side ultimately win. And if you tell them. That's actually meaningless because we're going to rerun the whole thing. What damage does that do to our whole democratic process? Janet, thank you for your call. Well, look, I've got so many of you want to speak on this subject. We will keep this going for the next half an hour or so. Did that march? Did that march in London yesterday? Do you think that actually that march strengthened the case for a second referendum? And if you believe that... 03456060973. You can text to 84850. Tweet using the hashtag Farage and LBC at LBC. And of course, comment on Facebook too. And then at half 11, uh, we might, we'll have to move on and we've got to talk about Saudi Arabia. Um, I've got an interview with Lord Green, who was the British ambassador for four and a half years in Saudi Arabia, to talk a bit about the country. And what do we do? Do we put sanctions on Saudi Arabia or is Donald Trump right that if we do that, actually, it could hurt us a lot more 
that it's going to hurt them. It all starts in a minute. Well, Lord Adonis is a huge advocate of the second referendum of the self-styled people's vote. I had a debate with him at 10 o'clock here in the LBC studio. It's up on lbc.co.uk, so you can refer back to it and look at it at any point that you want later on today. I'm going to, from half past the hour, talk about Saudi Arabia, talk about the disappearance of Jamal Khashoggi, talk about the fact that clearly the Saudis were not telling the truth and now they're just beginning to, and whether... We ought to take sanctions against Saudi Arabia. After all, we we would if it was Russia, wouldn't we, behaving like this? I mean, we really would. Uh, But economically, if we do that, is it possible that they could hurt us more than we could hurt them? Certainly President Trump seems to think that. But let's continue this debate because I want to know whether all those people out on the streets of London yesterday, I want to know whether that strengthens the case for a second referendum. I don't believe it does in any way at all. But hey, Paul is a new caller from Brixton and was a marcher yesterday. Hi, Paul. Hello, Nigel. How are you? Welcome. Good morning. So, as as I tried to joke earlier, there were lots of you crammed in the streets and it was more of a shuffle than a march, I believe. Uh, Yeah, that may have been the case. What I wanted to ask you, Nigel, is I'm actually not fully convinced that a, that a second referendum is is the best step. Okay. My, my, my real concern comes from reflecting on whenever we make um, big decisions, be that in the public sector or in the private sector, mm-hmm. you wouldn't really have such a make such a big decision in this way. You wouldn't ask one question, wait so long, and then without reviewing things, go back to that question. So to, to use an example, when any decision is made in the public sector, they have to follow the government's green book business case guidelines. And that says that you have to do a strategic business case that goes, is this the right thing to do? Yes or no? Kind of like the first referendum. And that was clear. We thought yes. What you then do is, is an outline business case that kind of comes up with some options of the ways in which you could actually do what you said you want to do. And you'd appraise them and then you have another decision point where you go, which of those options should we do? Once you've decided that, you'd even then go and do a full business case to finally make sure that what we're actually planning to do uh, is sensible and agrees with the original decision. So how do you apply that? So, Paul, how do you apply those principles to uh, the public of this country? Uh, Are you suggesting we go back to them with a menu in the form of a second referendum? Because that might confuse people even further. Yeah, um, at, at the minute, and I am changing my mind on this kind of, you know, on a weekly basis, that does seem the most sensible thing. And that's why... A kind of a second referendum where you would have, say, a range of options, each with you know mm. a bit more detail. Because, because for all of the options, we do know more now than we knew t- two years ago, and there are good and bad points both for leaving and for remaining. And actually, presenting people with here are some options, and you do something like alternative vote, where your number of, uh, in preference, so it's not just first past the post. Oh, I think you'd kill the turnout, wouldn't you? I mean, surely, surely, a referendum has to be a binary choice. You know, the idea that you put three or four different options on a ballot paper uh, with a preferential voting system, I think, frankly, uh, people would be so confused by it, uh, I'm not sure they'd turn maybe, out... Maybe, maybe you're right then, Nigel, and perhaps the best way to then approach this is, is through representative democracy, and so MPs or, or however else make decisions on our part. My, my point here is, is not necessarily to argue which is the, the best way to do this, mm. but the idea that we are making a decision... And then two years later, there was, a, there was somebody at the march yesterday who, did, who gave a great analogy of imagine uh, agreeing to have an operation and then a, 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 while waiting for the operation, the doctors disagree on certain things, then come back to you and say that the risks are different. Some are better, some are worse. But you're still going to go ahead with the operation without having a chance to reconsider but, because but, but you all of that, Paul, to it two years ago. Yeah, but all of that, Paul, is framed in economics, you see. And as we get closer to the date of March the 29th. You know, we'll be told mm-hmm. that every firm in Britain will close down, you know, the Great Depression will come and all the rest of it. No, I don't think anyone's promised uh, saying that. People oh, are saying we're getting that there. Jobs we're getting there. But the reality, Paul, is what this referendum actually was all about and what that question we voted on was about was a constitutional decision. It wasn't an economic decision. It was a, do we wish to stay part of political union with Europe or become an independent country? And that hasn't changed one bit. But I, I think that, Nigel, is exactly where pe- people are quite wrong, because actually, there, was it 17, however many millions of people voted for Brexit, my parents included, mm. each of those voted for different reasons. And you are completely right, some people will have voted because of uh, us being an independent country and this, mm. 
Some will have voted entirely because of immigration. Some will have voted but entirely because of wanting to open but, trade with the rest of the world. But, 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 but Paul, actually, actually, immigration... You did it for this reason yeah, alone. Yeah, but immigration was just a subset, wasn't it, of actually running our own country? For some people, yes, and for others, no. And, mm. and I think anyone who, who argues one way, leave or remain, you, you cannot attribute the majority of people, because the margin was so slim... Well, it wasn't that, really, um, was it? went one way. It wasn't well, really. Was it? I mean, it's pretty... It was, I mean, it wasn't as if it was... It, it wasn't exactly 10,000 votes, was it? I mean, it, no, it, no, no, but uh, as a percentage, there was about 2% vote between it, and it's very hard for anyone, yeah. whether you'll leave or... 4%, sorry, leave or remain, to mm. attribute that to a specific cause, so because Paul, there were a myriad of factors. Paul, you've been toying around with this in your head, very clearly, trying to find the right way forward. Let, let me push you on this. Okay. You know, is there, is there something that could be done that would begin to unite the country, in your opinion? Yes, I, I, I believe stopping the kind of narrative of the people have spoken. Because actually, when, when the, the people, and this is anecdotal here, but the people I speak to who both voted leave and remain I kind of accept and acknowledge that the people are divided more than anything. And actually, while there was a, a 2% uh, margin of victory for one side, the vast majority of people are in complete disagreement on this. And actually, it is not a clear wow. case. And so to, to go ahead with such a monumental, you know, the, the biggest issue certainly of, of, of my time, um, based on such a narrow margin of victory, well, Paul, I, 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 no, I, I don't accept that premise. Uh, the one thing I see uniting people around the country, and I spend perhaps more time outside the M25 than I spend within it, which I think makes a difference on this. The one thing I see, Paul, is people saying, let's just get on with it. But, Paul, thank you very much for your thoughts. The march does make a difference, I get by text. It encourages the EU to keep stalling till we vote again. And this is one of the problems, folks, that right from day one, what we've had with the Remain campaign is a consistent attempt to undermine the British position for basically encouraging Barnier to try and make life impossible for Mrs May, which he's very successfully done. You know, we've not actually been giving ourselves the advantages that we could have got from Brexit, but that's where we are. Politicians like Adonis are mixing deal or no deal with leave or remain, and it's shameful, says Dan from London. Stephen on Facebook takes a different view. He thinks the Brexiteers are drunk on magical thinking about making England great again and continuing the border with science fiction technology and an exaggerated sense of their importance in the world. They show no signs of sobering up. Stephen, I tell you what, matey, Actually, the one thing Brexiteers really do want is to be enormously proud of us as an independent, self-governing country. And do you know something, Stephen? We believe in Britain, and we can believe we can do a damn sight better getting out from underneath the control of these bureaucrats in Brussels who I view as a bunch of gangsters. But if you marched yesterday and you think being controlled by the European Commission is terrific please, 0345 tell me why. Natasha says you can't vote twice. That's not democracy. Uh, Kylie Ann, as a new caller from Edinburgh, good morning to you. Morning, Nigel. So, does that march bring us closer to a second referendum? No, I, I don't think so. Um, I mean, as, as you can hear, I am from Scotland, and I actually, in the Scottish referendum, I voted no. Mm. Um, I voted to stay as part of Britain because I feel that we're stronger uh, together. In, in the European referendum, I voted remain. Mm. But because the country have decided to leave, we have to get on with it. That's, that's what we've decided. I mean, it, it's not what I decided, but the country as a whole want to leave. So I feel that we should just kind of Mm. get down to it and, and get on with it, really. <laughs> uh, Would well, you know, I think... You're very much backing up what I'm being told going around the country. And, and, and I think there are quite a lot of people like you, people who voted Remain, but now say we've made a democratic decision, let's just get on with it. Um, and I think there is now quite a clear majority for just getting on with it. It's funny, isn't it, though? I mean, you're from Edinburgh. Uh, Nicola Sturgeon doesn't respect either of those referendums, does she? No, I think she's wanting to have another one just to be able to get the answer that she wants. But again, Scotland voted no, so we should just get on with it. I mean, we've, we've remained with the UK. The UK and I want to leave Europe, so I feel that we should stop trying to have a second, third, fourth referendum to be able to get the decision that we want. We should work together and just 
be the best country that we no. can be. We've and decided to leave, so we should just get on with so it. So basically, the message from you on this Sunday morning is respect the is respect both referendums and get on with it. Yeah. Yes. Absolutely. Thank you very much indeed. The work. There we are. That was really very succinct, wasn't it? And I do think there are a lot more Kylie Anns out there than people realise. I genuinely do. Colin is a new caller from Sandhurst. Good morning, Colin. Morning, Nigel. Morning. So, a lot of people are marching yesterday. Does it make any difference, though? Yeah, I think I think it does make a difference, simply for the fact that what this is doing is uh, promoting the idea. Right, it is campaigning this idea and bringing attention to this idea. You're talking about it on your show. Uh-huh. Uh, it, it's giving an opportunity. I wasn't at the march, but certainly they would have had some sort of speakers. They would have people, um, <clears throat> you know, working a message, talking about the fact that um, even the European Union is going to have these uh, issues with it, and and that is going to help people who are on the fence who might be able to help get behind this idea. Um, bring it you know bring it to potentially happening so i I think that from from if anybody is for leaving the european union this Mm -hmm. sort of thing is adding to that momentum you know it's helping that may well be true yeah that may very well be true just as you know when mr barnier stands up and gets tough in a way that helps us just make our minds up uh colin difficult to difficult to work out yet what the response is but you may be right i thank you for your call and caroline from hans asks me if we have brexit in name only awful would this mean we would have no meps well at the moment the meps are due to leave the european parliament at midnight european time on march 29th i'm told that our passes won't work the next morning we'll be out in the streets with our bags um, and i for one would be very very happy I think what you got earlier on this morning from Lord Adonis was a hint of where this is really going. They don't really want a second referendum. They want to raise the issue and get Article 50 suspended, which could mean, given a three-year transition, that the argument that we'd be trapped inside something without any say, people like Adonis would say, oh, we have to have our say, so we need to have, we need to fight the European elections next year, and we need to have an EU commissioner. What are the chances of that? I still don't think it will happen, but it's certainly a possibility. Oh no, I couldn't possibly face another five years there, nor nor could they face me for another five years or whatever it was. You're listening to the Sunday edition of the Nigel Farage Show here on LBC and it's 11.15. Lots of marches in London, does it change things? Nigel, do you think a pro-Brexit march would show that the well-informed Brexit voters have not changed their minds, says Barry from Burton-upon-Trent. Well, Barry, uh, as opposed to marches, I've been going around the country believe means leave. I've done four meetings in the last eight days. So uh, you have to say that the Leave campaign have got themselves reorganised once again, having perhaps somewhat disappeared for the last couple of years. I'm going to Clapham to speak to Joanne, a new caller to the show. Good morning. Hi, good morning, Nigel. So, did yesterday make any difference, do you think? I personally think that if it's about stopping Brexit, no. Brexit's right. going to go ahead regardless. Uh-huh. Um, I think it's far too difficult to unpack at this point in time. Mm-hmm. And it would probably be suicide for us as a country to try and pursue that. But I think in the longer term, for the politicians that are involved in this, uh, it, it should be a very stark reminder to them that this goes far beyond the Brexit. They have a long-term political career to worry about, and particularly for the Conservatives, and to an extent Labour, and people such as yourself. Um, it should be an indication to you that at least half of the country are very, very unhappy, and the other half that voted for the Brexit should they not get what they want, they're going to vote against any policy that supports the Brexit in the longer term. So it should be quite a concern. Well, I understand the point you're making, although when you really drill down, Joanne, how many people really think the European Union is something that we should remain part of on current terms? It's only about 20%. Right, but I don't really think that that has an impact. As you always said, um, if this is really about people's day-to-day lives and how it impacts them and, you know, what it means to the normal voter who doesn't live in London, et cetera, et cetera. Do you not think that the implications of the Brexit and the politicking that's gone on over the last year, two years, is going to have quite a catastrophic impact on the players who have been a part of this process? Um, I, jo- jo- Joanne, I think actually, and sort of picking up your theme, um, I think this whole Brexit issue has the ability to split 
uh, the Labour Party and Conservative parties. Uh, the Conservative Party is deeply split in the House of Commons, but relatively united in the country. The Labour Party is un relatively united in the House of Commons, but deeply split in the country. So, yeah, I think these divisions um, that do exist on opinion out there are very, very strong, and I don't think we've seen the last of the impact of Brexit. I really don't. Do you see any way, Joanne, of this sort of um, being healed or calming down in the future, or, or do we stay divided on this issue? I think it will be a natural healing process because, uh, in general, if we look at who voted for Brexit, who voted against it, there is a demographic trend that um, people of a certain generation, let's say 20 to 40 year olds, didn't mm -hmm. vote for the Brexit. Now, those people are going to be our future leaders and they're also going to be running the country and having the biggest days, like kind of the Middle England concept. So in the longer term, I think the healing will be natural because the people who voted to remain, basically, will take a much stronger role in our society. Well, it's a very interesting point. It's a very interesting point because the bizarre thing, Joanne, and I've said this before, whilst, the, and that's not all by any means, but the majority of young people here were on the remain side. When you go to Italy, the big majority of young people are very, very Eurosceptic, very unhappy with the European Union. So who knows where we'll all be in 10 or 20 years' time. Joanne, thank you for your point and your call. Roger is a new caller from Chelmsford up in Essex. Good morning, Roger. Good morning, Nigel. Um, oh, I just want to say first, you must be exhausted with all this Brexit talk. And I just want to say thank you for the dedication uh, and the conviction to stick it out. I look back at videos and, and I know my friends and people who both like to remain and leave watching the uh, EU Parliament and with uh, your dark hair, not yeah. so grey, and we think, God, you've been uh, sticking us out well, for a long I'm, time. Well, so Roger, thank I'm, you, you I've know? been doing this on and off for 25, 25 years. <laughs> no. Um, so, no, I mean, I really do. I mean, I firstly, Roger, I believe the European Union is a false project, that it won't survive, and I think you're seeing the cracks showing already right across Europe. I think it's a false creation. I think a Europe of nations states cooperating and trading makes sense. I don't think a Europe run by a European Commission does. So I've believed passionately for 25 years that we're better off outside of it. And I, and, and I haven't changed that view one bit, Roger. And I don't, I don't believe yesterday's march makes much, much difference. In fact, Liz on Facebook says to me, she says, the march makes a difference. Yes, makes me even more determined to leave. So how does it make you feel, Roger, when you see those pictures? <laughs> Yeah, well, I mean, the two points I want to make. The, the march, I think, you hit the nail on the head earlier, will just make things more messy, will make more delay. Uh, and it's not going to affect the outcome, evidently. I think uh, everyone recorded has pointed out we've had marches with, with far higher numbers and they've not yes. resulted in, in what they wanted. Um, secondly, the other point I wanted to make, and ask every caller who's listening now who did vote remain, who has called you today, and they mention about half the country being unhappy, well, let's hypothetically say it was 40, 52 remain mm. and 48 leave. Would they be as conscious to listen to us? Would they be as conscious to say, hold on, well, it, half the country's not happy. They wouldn't give Let's a damn this. what we thought, Roger. Absolutely. Because because Absolutely. Be, because the, because they are supported by big business and big money, and that's what this is all about, Roger. Yeah, exactly, exactly. But, um, but yeah, I, I think the march won't have any outcome. It's just going to really drag things out and make it more messy, which it doesn't need to be. Uh, it's a real shame. No, OK, thank you very much indeed for that. And the other point is, you know, the idea that all 48% support a second referendum is nonsense. You know, we had the call from Edinburgh a moment ago. There are plenty of people out there. About a third of those who voted remain accept the result. Because do you know what? We're supposed to be a democracy. I've got a new caller from Madrid. It's Terence. Good morning to you. Good morning, Nigel. Nice to speak to you. Good to speak to you. Um, so, you saw that good. happening yesterday. Is it going to change I, things? I, I did indeed. And I'd like to just um, follow up on your last point, that the 48%, not all of them won a second referendum. Um, I voted Remain, and yep. um, I don't think the... I wouldn't like to see at the moment uh, a second referendum. In fact. OK, um, why? However, I do think that maybe the people should have some kind of say. And what I mean by that is Theresa May has come so far from what she originally said. Mm. And the Conservative Party are in complete disarray, as are the Labour Party, to be honest. Mm -hmm. And I think that maybe there has never been a better time to have a general election. But the trouble with the general um, election, Terence, is what would the choice be? Because what would both parties well, say on the well, European this, issue? This, but, but equally, this, this, would people I vote mean, on that uh, or would they vote on the health service or whatever else it may be? It's kind of what I'm getting at, you see. I thought in the last general election, both parties, um, you know, they would lead the European Union. And, um, you know, I think, I think the march yesterday showed evidence that, you know, a lot of Labour supporters would like to stay in the European Union. However, I'd be intrigued to know if the, um, what the outcome would be if Labour actually campaigned 
in a, in a in a general election to remain in the European Union. Well, that would be fast. You know, yeah, now that would be interesting, they, to, it, Terence. That would be very. But but I tell you what, they do. If an election was called between now and Christmas, do you know what Labour would do? They'd fudge it completely. Possibly, Nigel. Possibly, they'd fudge it completely, see, and they bring us. <coughs> excuse me. Does, they does bring us no closer. Just on, slight, just on a slight sort of, um, just sort of coming off it for a second. Not just Theresa May. I'm not just angry at Theresa May. I'm angry at David Davis, Jacob Rees Mogg. These are people who are actively involved in the Conservative Party. They're big names. Yep. Now, now is the time to either put up or shut up. I couldn't agree in more. In my opinion. I couldn't agree more, Terence. If they, why are they writing all these articles, urging the Prime Minister to change course when it's clear she's not going to? Why don't they stand up honestly and say, go? I completely agree. David Davis spends, you know, an hour in a, you know talking about how bad Theresa May is doing, just with about everything, including Brexit, well, mostly, yeah. mostly Brexit. And in but, the next breath, he, he says, she's a good Prime Minister. I, I, well, yeah. she's not, mate. You, you spent uh, the last yeah, hour yeah, telling yeah, us yeah, she's yeah. And we know you're not telling the truth. I mean, Boris's speech at the conference, wasn't it? The big fringe meeting, you know, he slags the whole thing off. Chequers being a betrayal. And then he finishes up by saying, back to Theresa May. And I think, Boris, you don't believe that. We don't believe that you believe that. Ter- Terence, I think your point... Put up or shut up is absolutely right to a Tory or a sceptics. I agree with you. Thank you for your call. Going to go to York and speak to James. James, good morning. Uh, morning. Thanks for yesterday and how we get say You were fantastic. You reinvigorated a lot of people. Well, so, uh, it, that's it kind of it. Yeah, I mean, we have got a cross-party leave campaign going again because we'd left... Yeah. I, I think, hands up from me and everybody else, we'd left too much of a vacuum. You know, we'd left... Yeah, that's right. Well, I just... I just want to make um, a point, really. If yes. there was a second referendum, not a multiple choice, because a multiple choice is ridiculous, yeah, and it's it what is. the establishment would want, it would water it down and people would just be completely, um, you know. But if Remain won, say they nicked it, Remain, 52-48, uh-huh. uh-huh. what do you think, the say, 15, 16 million Brexiteers in the, around the country are going to do? Do you think we're just going to lie down and not? It could cause severe civil unrest. The reason people are divided is because we haven't got a leader who's come out two years ago and said, this is what we're doing, this is the direction. You may have voted this way, but come on, guys, you know, young people, you're going to get on the housing ladder. Mm. Explain some economics to them with regards to housing and... James, I'm not going to... I'm not going to encourage... I'm not going to encourage civil unrest, obviously. I think... I'll tell you what I think. If they forced a second referendum and there was a narrow win for Remain and the establishment then told us this is now settled for all time, which is what they'd do, uh, I think the effect of that would be uh, that it would split our existing political parties and something completely brand new would come along in British politics because people would feel wholly unrepresented and, and, and deeply resented and resent the fact they'd be made a vote again. James, anything that could bring people together in your view? Uh, no, uh, we need a new prime minister. That's the point. Because <laughs> if we carry on, if we carry on, right? You know these snobby remainers like Tories, but slightly set of Blairites and Camerons. Mm. We're going to end up with a Corbyn government, and he'll just come down on all these snobby law, law you know, law firms and people earning plenty of money in the city. Um, and that's what they're missing. So I just think we need a new Prime Minister. Do you know what we and need, James? Okay, Boris and Jacob we saying all these things. What are they doing? I know, I know, I agree. James, I agree completely. Thank you for your call. Thank you, all of you, for your calls. Um, in a moment, we're going to talk to Lord Andrew Green, the former British ambassador to Saudi Arabia, to find out what he thinks about the disappearance of this journalist, Jamal Khashoggi, and what we should do about it, and whether doing something could hurt us more than it hurts them, or as a matter of principle, given what's happening happening in Yemen, do we need to do something? You're listening to the Sunday edition of the Nigel Farage Show here on LBC. It's now 11.30 in time for the news with Philip Krisikos. On the 2nd of October, Washington Post journalist and Saudi national Jamal Khashoggi went into the Saudi embassy in Istanbul and he's not been seen again. Uh, We initially got denials from the Saudi Arabian regime that they had anything to do with it. Now they've admitted that he did die inside the embassy following a fist fight, all of which sounds very odd. This morning, uh, Brexit Secretary Dominic Raab was being interviewed on this, and he said that the explanation from the Saudis about the death in the consulate is not credible. Uh, he said, I don't think it's credible. I think it's a terrible case. Well, it's certainly that. Um, and Donald Trump 
Uh, well, Trump, interesting, isn't it? Normally, Donald Trump's so decisive, isn't he, on foreign policy? Boom, he says something. People say, wow, that's a bit scary. Uh, and he uses it as a big negotiating position. But on this, Donald Trump has been here and he's been here. But ultimately, the big Trump argument isn't so much about what's happened to this journalist, but more about what might happen to America's trade and jobs. Let's listen to him. We'll be talking to them. We'll see what happens. We may have some questions. We do have some questions. Congress is very interested in this one, and we'll be working with Congress. But I would prefer that we don't use as retribution cancelling $110 billion worth of work, which means 600,000 jobs. Now, this is a subject, this is a country about which I think the honest truth is very few of us know much about. So to get a feel for what Saudi Arabia is like as a country uh, and what perhaps we need to do in the future. I spoke earlier on to Lord Andrew Green, who was for four and a half years the UK ambassador to Saudi Arabia. Well, I think the first thing to say is that it's a very different society indeed. Um, they uh, start, as it were, from somewhere else. It is a, a very traditional society. Uh, they have been ruled by a king for certainly the last 70 years. Um, and they are, to a considerable extent, a, a tribal society. So uh, one can't really make comparisons. Um, the other aspect of their life, which is very strong, of course, is Islam. They're the, the, very proud of having the two holiest places in Islam. Yes. Uh, and there's, uh, the uh, religious uh, leaders in Saudi Arabia are very powerful. And that's one reason, for example, why the death penalty is still there. Uh, the religious leaders insist that they should follow the, what they believe to be the, the teachings of the Quran. So it's a very complex society. Um, and beneath the surface, there's always been a, a tough secret police, if you like. The General Intelligence Department uh, would jump on any kind of opposition, of which there wasn't very much, to be, to be fair. But they certainly jumped on it. Uh, things have changed in recent years with the new uh, crown prince who effectively rules the country, and, and that, that's a different atmosphere now. This is, this is MBS, as he's known, Mohammed. This is MBS, Mohammed bin Salman. Yeah. Um, early 30s, enormously, uh, uh, I have to say, conceited, really, uh, has the complete confidence of his father, who is now a very old man, uh, has come to power at a young age, and who uh, thinks that he is... Um, dare I say, God's gift to Saudi Arabia and the world. But has he genuinely modernised the country, or is this all spin for the West? You can't modernise a country like that in two or three years. He's done one or two things, like allowing women to drive. Uh, he's somewhat increased the representation of women, which has been there for 20 years anyway. Um, no, I think the changes to Saudi society are, are pretty limited, and I'm not at all sure how much he really wants to achieve in that direction. No, that's interesting. Now, this journalist, Jamal Khashoggi, he goes into the embassy, the Saudi embassy in Istanbul. He disappears. Uh, mm. we, we get a whole series of stories coming out of the Saudi government. I mean, the first one was he'd left the embassy shortly after he'd entered. Uh, then there's a complete denial that anything's gone wrong, and now we know that he's died, possibly in a fist fight. Uh, I was amazed when President Trump started off by saying the story was credible. How, how credible How credible does it sound to you? <laughs> I can't think of anything less credible, frankly. <laughs> Quite. I mean, really, yes. amazing. I think the, the Saudi attempts to explain all this, it's an extremely sad event, of course, but the Saudi attempts to deny it are becoming farcical, really. I mean, why were 15 security personnel flown in that afternoon? Why were the local staff, the Turkish staff, sent home? And above all, of course, where's the body? Yes, and isn't this actually rather embarrassing for Turkey as well? Yes, uh, it is. Well, for a whole range of reasons. I mean, it's extremely insulting that, that the Saudis should do such a thing in a diplomatic mission in their country. I mean, it's an outrage on, on all fronts. Um, and the pack of, uh, shall we say, porkies that are coming out of Riyadh are no help. And this was done presumably because this journalist had a powerful position at the Washington Post and was a persistent critic of MBS. Yes, and a bit more than that. I mean, he's, he was in touch with some opposition elements, I think. Um, and he had, he had two million followers on Twitter. 
Um, and that you know, gives anyone uh, quite a lot of influence, uh, as you know yourself, I think. Well, I know. It, 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 can, it can be useful, but equally yeah. get you into lots of trouble as well. Well, obviously, yeah. it's a very shocking event. And, and yeah. you know, we hear rumours of dismemberment of the body and disposal yeah. in a park. And we don't quite yet know the absolute truth. But what is interesting is when the Russians are seen to have done anything like this, uh, the call goes up very quickly for sanctions mm-hmm. to be imposed. Uh, and yet, I think what the public see is a reluctance almost from our governments uh, in terms of doing anything about Saudi Arabia because the suspicion is of trade. Just how important is the economic interchange between the UK and Saudi Arabia? Well, Saudi Arabia is extremely important to us, not just for trade. I mean, they're they're a regional power of some importance. They are, uh, if you like, an uh, an opposition element to the Iranians who have... uh, ambitions that are no help to us. Uh, The Saudis, of course, are a huge source of oil for the world. Uh, They're a trading partner for us. They're an intelligence partner. uh, And they're a market for our defense equipment. So they are very important indeed. Uh, And I can understand why um, the US and the UK, who have particularly strong relations with the Saudis, want to play this carefully. And you mentioned the Russians, but in, in that case, we knew exactly what had happened. We had the evidence, we gave it to our partners, and we kicked out all these Russian intelligence officers. So yep. it, was, it, was, it was a clear case. Here, it's, uh, we don't yet have evidence to that standard, although nobody denies that the terrible thing has happened. But if the evidence is found, Lord Green, isn't the truth that we're unlikely, the UK or America, to do very much? Because apart from trade, they could... Could they not? I mean, you know, the oil price is currently over $80 a barrel. And people can remember or at least read that back in 1973, it, mm. was, it was the Saudis uh, that led to this cutting off of the oil supply that caused such huge economic harm in the West. Mm. Yes, um, I think that, that could be a factor. Um, actually, some statement by the Saudis could have a pretty strong effect on the price as well, as you know. So um, one has to be careful of that. But I think it's, it's a bit wider than that. I think that we have all those interests that I've just listed. Yep. And so we have, we have to trade carefully, uh, but we have to do something. I mean, this is an outrageous thing to happen, and it simply can't, can't be allowed to pass. So what do you think we should do? If the evidence is found that absolutely he was murdered in the embassy, we found the body, what do you think the right course of action would be? Well, I think the first thing we have to do is team up with the Americans who, who have the decisive influence in, uh, of any foreign power in Saudi Arabia. Secondly, I don't think that we should deny defense equipment because they'd simply buy it from the Chinese or someone. Uh, what I would like to see personally is uh, an Anglo-US, indeed a Western, s- serious pressure on the Saudis to ease off in Yemen. Uh, to make sure that food gets through to the people who are starving. It's an absolute outrage what's happening in, in Yemen. And the Saudis are in a position, at some cost to their interests perhaps, uh, but they're in a position to help in the Yemen, and they should, they should certainly do so. Would it be a fair comment to say that weapons and weapons equipment that we're selling to Saudi Arabia are being used in Yemen right now? Yes, it would. Um, I think our government would say that we have advisers there who try to ensure that they use them uh, in, a, in a careful manner. But um, large bombs in a careful manner are <coughs> nonetheless a um, contribution to the, to the casualties. Um, th- th- there are more sides than one to this, to be fair, because the, the uh, rebels in the Houthi rebels in, in Yemen are from time to time firing missiles at Saudi airports. So if someone was firing a missile at, at Heathrow, we might have something to say about it. Um, so it is, it's, not, it's not simple, but what I really object to is the way in which the Yemeni people are simply being starved, and that can't be allowed to continue. Well, that was Lord Andrew Green, whose voice you may recognise. He's the boss of Migration Watch in the UK, but he was the British ambassador for four and a half years in Saudi Arabia. Um, outlining there... Uh, I think, uh, our indirect role in these pretty shocking things that are going on in Yemen at the moment. But, folks, the West's taken a big view. Uh, America, particularly, has decided that the Saudis are the good guys, the Iranians are the bad guys. And when Trump says that putting sanctions in place could hurt us more than it could hurt them, is he right? Or are there moral objections that matter more? I'm going to get a hitch in and speak to Mark on this. Mark, good morning. 
Yeah, morning, Nigel. Yeah, I think we're, we're, what, what's going to uh, what's going to play out here is, is very is, is very clear. The Saudis have realised that the West have now falling into this world of alternative facts and fake news. And then when you know when you have the president of the United States being sort of one of the key advocates of that, they're just going to keep running a story where they believe they can. Um, create what the Americans would call plausible deniability. And unfortunately, we're seeing that, you know, across the whole of the Western world, particularly in the UK, and even from yourself, Nigel. So th- that's Go really on. concerning. Go on. Well, well, for example, this, that, the beginning of this week, uh, somebody challenged you, for example, over the Irish border and things that you said. Mm. You said to them, can you give me one piece of evidence that I was asked about the Irish border issue once during the, the referendum? Yeah. Yeah, or in the 25 years up to the referendum. Yeah. Well, actually, Nigel, people did find it. You actually did, they? did talk about it at the Ulster University on the 1st of March 2016. Oh, well, Mark, and I tell you what, I tell you what, Mark, I tell you what, if I was in Ulster University, I'm not surprised the question was asked, um, but, you know, the general point I was making was that in 25 years it had not been an issue. Mark, let me get back to this point. Nigel, stop there. No, Nigel, stop there. You were asked the question, and you told people in there, that things would remain exactly the same. And not only was that reported well, well, by... Do you the know Irish what, Mark? I've done... Uh, do you know... Do you know no, 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 no. Do you know how many thousands... Do you know how many thousands of meetings and questions I've done in 25 years? A lot. If you found, if you found one in 25 years, well done to you. OK, let me ask you, Mark, quickly. Is Trump right that if we put sanctions on Saudi, it would hurt us more than it would hurt them? Um... Well, uh, unfortunately, the national interest will kick in for all the countries in the West. They need a power base or partner in um, that part of the world. The Saudis would be ideal. We have the oil issue. But, Nigel, you know, at the end of the day, like I said, fake news. You've been caught out and you're oh, not even apologising. Oh of course I'm not, Mark. If, if, it, if I was asked about it at Belfast University, I'm not surprised. I certainly can't think of any media interview, but I know there wasn't one at any point in the referendum campaign where I was asked. You're listening to the Sunday edition of the Nigel Farage Show here on LBC. It's now 11.47. Oh, Lord Green, our former ambassador, was making the point uh, that if we want to put big sanctions on Saudi Arabia, they would simply go and buy the weapons somewhere else. And one of you on Twitter says that he was too afraid to fully condemn the Saudis and thinks it's okay to keep selling them bombs as usual, saying if we don't sell them, somebody else will. Two wrongs don't make a right. Let's listen to what President Trump said on this. We'll be talking to them. We'll see what happens. We may have some questions. We do have some questions. Congress is very interested in this one, and we'll be working with Congress. But I would prefer that we don't use as retribution cancelling $110 billion worth of work, which means 600,000 jobs. And similarly, there was talk that over the next decade, there could be 100 million, sorry, there could be $10 billion worth of business taking place between us and Saudi Arabia. So whichever way you look at it, We've got big business interests with Saudi Arabia, but I thought what Lord Green said in answer to my question about what's going on in Yemen, when I asked the question directly, are British munitions being used in that war in Yemen? He was pretty clear, wasn't he? Yes. So what should we do? Clive is calling from five. Good morning, Clive. Good morning, Mr. Farage. How are you today? I am (coughs) fine. What did you make of Lord Green's comments, particularly about Yemen? I think... I think the unbelievable hypocrisy coming from our side just goes to show that we're just legitimising what the Saudis have done over decades now. They're chopping people's heads off, chopping Mm -hmm. people's hands off, jailing people without trial for decades, for daring to criticise them. You know, and we've been openly supporting them. We've been schmoozing them and down the street. There's 33 MPs, I believe, been to Saudi Arabia for freebies, trips, somebody had a gold watch off somebody as a gift it's disgusting but I think what Lord Green says is right I think I mean there's, there's nothing short of a genocide that they're committing against Yemen you know and he, he did say that Yemeni Houthi rebels were firing an occasional missile at Saudi airports he did yeah you know I mean look what the Saudis are doing they're, they're, they're killing busfuls of children for God's sake man Where's the international outrage? Well, he also... Well, Clive, Clive, this is almost the forgotten war going on in the world, isn't it? I mean, almost nobody ever talks about it. And the other point that that, uh, Lord Green made was that, effectively, the people of Yemen are being starved. And and we're talking about millions of people here. We are complicit in this genocide, Nigel. The UK is complicit. The Tory government and the governments before have openly supported the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia doing what they've been doing, beheading people in the street. 
I mean, Clive, this, now, is, this is not a party political issue, is it? Because from what I can no, see... No, no. It goes back decades. That's what I'm saying. It goes back yeah. to the Labour government, yeah. various Tory governments. We need to get away from them. And the whole thing, people are of the opinion that Saudi can just turn off the tap on oil. They can't, you know? They're part of OPEC. I mean, OPEC would kick them out if they'd done that. Well, okay, Clive, Saudi Arabia, yeah, Clive hang, on a, hang on a second. Yes, they're part of OPEC, um, but the real point here is they are the dominant partner in OPEC and when yeah. when back in 1973 and it was mm-hmm. seen as it was seen as punishment for the west support of Israel during the Yom Kippur war uh, when they limited and, and and albeit OPEC was far <coughs> more powerful than it is today in terms of the percentage of production over which it had some say but when well, but when they decided to punish us Clive and I, I don't know whether you're old enough to remember uh, I five. It, yeah, well, I'm old enough to remember, and, you know, what happened was um, that the oil price quadrupled in a year, leading to huge economic misery. So, so well, there's a flip side of the coin as well, Nigel. Remember yeah. after the Scottish independence referendum in 2015 yes. when the oil prices took a real dive? Yes. You know, and everybody was blaming it and saying SNP, ah, just as well you weren't independent. Mm-hmm. That was OPEC doing that on purpose to punish America for fracking and developing the tar sands and the Canadian border. That was direct punishment from OPEC. It has nothing to do with oil running out. It was a cynical right. move to punish America for daring to develop their own oil wells. You know, what and would you do, Clive? Daring... What would you do, Clive? Sorry? I mean, I mean, you clearly want to take a you want to take a principled position with Saudi Arabia, and I suspect, yeah. that, and I suspect there are lots of people listening to this right now that would agree with you. What do you think we should do? Well, it's obvious that they killed this poor guy inside the Saudi embassy mm-hmm. in Turkey. I mean, and you know what gets me, Nigel? Right. Liam Fox had a conference with his American counterpart before they took a stance on this, before yep. the UK government came in and took a, took a stance. We need to detach ourselves totally from America. We're dancing to America's tune all the time, you know? And the crap that Donald Trump came out well, with... Well, thank you, on, Clive. Um, Clive, would you, would you... I mean, in terms of choices, just very quickly, because I must move on, but in terms of choices, would you rather we sided with Iran than Saudi Arabia? I mean... I don't really see the problem with Iran, to be honest. I mean, I don't think they're any worse than Saudi Arabia. Well, I don't not, think they're I, I tell you, I tell you what, they're not great either. Clive, I'm going to no, go. But... I'm going to move on, Clive, because I want to get Sandra in. Last caller on this subject, Sandra from Muswell Hill, a new caller to the show. Good morning, Sandra. Good morning, Nigel. I, I, I I'm kind of siding on the, the side of Clive in most of what I have to say. Yes. But what I find truly, deeply disgusting is that if as Lord Green has intimated, we are up to our ears in, in making weaponry, that it's an enormous, it's such an important, important part of our GDP that we can't stop, and therefore we've got to start selling it to people. And the people we sell it to are the Saudi Arabians, who we know are going to use them and are using them mm-hmm. on the people in Yemen. Mm-hmm. And then we have on our television screens these pictures of children with enormous eyes and enormous stomachs, mm. And nothing, no food, no drink. Which is happening, Nothing yes. at all. Yeah. And they're dying. And this is deeply, deep. And we are asked, just, just pay three pounds. I'm always picking up the phone, paying three pounds here, three pounds there, three pounds for somewhere else. Mm. Because you have to do something. But within yourself, knowing that in this great country of ours, we are supporting a regime that, as Clive said, beheads people probably two or three a week and has done for years. Yeah, fifth, I, think, I think 50 people have been executed so far this year, so whatever, well, yeah, yeah, it, yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. It's pretty terrible. It's something like... But Sandra, but Sandra if, I, if I sat you down now uh, with okay. half a dozen people who work for the aerospace industry whose jobs depend upon it, would it be fair to put them out of work? Oh, Nigel, this is the thing. You see, if I could answer this question, I would be leader of the world. <laughs> well, I know, of I know, I, I know, I know. What we're I going know, back to I know. It's a is, huge, is where, it's, we've put, where we've put ourselves. It's a tough choice. Where we've put ourselves in terms of weaponry. But yeah. the aerospace industry is actually also brilliant at finding other ways to use this well, extraordinary technology. Well, maybe they'll have to. Sandra, I'm going to have to end it there. Uh, we're out of time. You can't put a price on human life, is what I get on Twitter. 
You've been listening to the Nigel Farage Show. I'm going to be back tomorrow night at 6. At 3 this afternoon, it's Ian Payne. But up next, it's Majid Nawaz. Thank you, Nigel. Coming up, five men who served their country on the front line have died suddenly in tragic circumstances over six days, exposing the scale of a mental health crisis gripping Britain's military veterans. Are we letting our military veterans down? Before that, Harvard University is being taken to court, accused of systematically discriminating against Asian American applicants, as its quota system has been used to cap the number of overachieving Asians it lets in. Are quotas in danger of worsening race relations and not helping? But first, a Tory rising star today issues a call to arms for MPs to oust Theresa May, saying Britain.